Hello, hello. Nice to start seeing everybody fill in. We'll give everybody a second to join here, but thank you to everybody. Gracias. Nice to have everybody with us. We're expecting a pretty good sized group, so we'll just wait a minute or so to allow people time to, to join. We got one question there. Okay. And I see we're already getting questions in there, yeah. guys. <laughs> um, so, so basically, at the at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, just so everybody knows, there's a Q and A section, and we're gonna do, we're gonna go through about twenty minutes of of Adam and I presenting what we think are the most important deal points for everybody. Uh, and then we'll do Q and A at the end. So anytime we're speaking, go ahead and, and fill in the Q and A, and we'll go through everything at at the end of the at the end of the presentation. Yeah. But I see a few are already tri tripling in <laughs> already. And Josh will drop his email in the conversation box for everybody, so that it's easy to do any follow up or anything you might need afterwards. What do you think? I'd right, say we get going. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. It's really an honor to have you you all join us here and to share with you the Series C investment opportunity in the in the Greek Coffee Company. My name is Adam Jason. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a member of the uh, partner of Legacy Group and a member of the board of directors of the Greek Coffee Company. Next to me is Cole Shepard, my partner at Legacy Group. And our founder and fellow board member at the at the Green Coffee Company. As I mentioned, today is the day we're sharing with you the Series C investment opportunity in the business. And I think to really kick us off, it's important to set the stage and tell a little bit of the story of where we were, where we are now, where we're going. You know, in 2017, five years ago, Cole, you came to me and said, I want to raise six million dollars. I want to buy coffee farms in Colombia. I want to build infrastructure around that. Mm -hmm. But really, I want to create an alternative investment product for investors who have already deployed and committed capital into Colombia and are looking for an alternative to really commercial real estate, but an asset class that functions in a similar way. Mm -hmm. We built the, the green coffee company on the back of that thesis, but I think it's fair to say probably neither of us contemplated really the, the scale and the magnitude of the opportunity when we're getting things definitely when we're getting things off of the off of the ground. A couple of years later, time to reflect a little bit of time to look under the hood. I think what we've seen as we've looked at the industry, the market, the country, we really got a sense of what that scale and the magnitude of that opportunity is. And we continue to share that with our investors. And we really want to, with this Series C funding round, take advantage of the full scale and scope of that opportunity that we see. So I think it would be interesting, Cole, if you want to share, what are some of the factors that you saw when we were doing that look under the hood exercise sure. where you said, this is an opportunity that we basically let's go for it? Absolutely. I think when we started, you know, we were competing with commercial real estate. You know, we had commercial real estate syndication investors who were comfortable in Colombia and they wanted to yield higher than commercial real estate. And that and that's almost job done of what our real goal was when we started this this project, which became obviously now it's an enterprise. 
you know, what we wanted to do was consolidate infrastructure, consolidate acquisitions bought at scale, and sell a little bit down uh, down the value chain. And we knew that one, nobody was doing this in Colombia. So we knew we had, I guess, a contrarian point of view that we could do something special. And you know, our our investors, they just want to see us build something that was unique asset backed and beating what they would get from buying a what we call a centro comercial or a shopping mall here in here in Colombia. Mm -hmm. That was the original thesis. Now, when we went into this, we knew that there was a couple things outstanding that that if we left the company open and we found opportunities, we'd want to scale upon uh, outside of the core thesis of consolidation play which we saw early on being that Colombia is a very deconsolidated market, we saw two areas that uh, we're going to touch on during this presentation that I think are massively important. One is vertical integration. We knew that going further down the value chain, being a commodity product that Colombia is, you can make significantly more money for investors if you go further down the value chain. And what we're going to talk about later in the presentation is really focus on roasting. It's not going all the way down the value chain to an RTD or ready to drink product or let's say an e-commerce channel, but really B2B sales at scale by taking it one more step from green coffee and saying, let's cook it, right? Roasted coffee, I'm saying is cooked coffee. Yeah. The, the third piece, which I think for investors who already know us and who have invested in the Series B, the third piece is byproducts. Before we even started the Green Coffee Company, we knew there was a massive gap macroeconomically in the coffee market to say, hey, what are people doing with byproducts of coffee? And for investors who are not comfortable or are familiar with coffee, 80% of what comes off a coffee tree is a byproduct. It is a coffee cherry with mucilage and a in the seed is what actually gets roasted and drank. And right now, primarily what happens is that is used as trash. It's it's a waste product. But now we're moving into monetizing that. And we'll go into that in more detail here later in the presentation. But that is a major change, both from our company perspective, but as the coffee industry as a whole. And it's something that no one else is doing at scale. So here in this Series C, we're the, one of the only companies in the world utilizing byproduct, and we're doing it at scale. So I'll, I'll on, on, a, on a similar theme of... What did we start seeing that we were capable of and where do we go from there? You know, I'd say probably about a year and a half, two years ago, we started saying, you know, we really can be the largest coffee producer in the country. It's the it's it's significant in the sense that it's the national product of the country. It's the third largest coffee producing country on earth. And everybody knows that coffee and, and Colombia are synonymous. The, the promise that we made to investors about a year ago is that we would achieve, achieve that milestone and get to be the largest producer of, of coffee in the country. If you look at our statistics here and our track record and where we've gone, we've achieved that milestone. We've gotten to number one. We're continuing, and I think important for investors, to start now seeing the, the fruits of their investment paying off as we translate into greater and greater sales. Last year, we did 1.3 million in sales. This year, we're looking at about 13.4. So that's a 10x multiple on 2021 sales with a nice, strong profitability standpoint. We couldn't have done it really without the capital that we've gotten from our investors, 35 million of investment to date. And really, I think we've done a good job, the management team, everybody on the team, deploying that into assets that we know are strong, long-term investments that are going to yield well for us going into the future and give us this springboard for the next piece of the conversation of where is the company going from here? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, just to add a couple things. I mean, we're at a point within the company where we are becoming macroeconomically important. There is not a lot of opportunities, both for me as an investor and, and a, a manager of a business, where you can say, we've gone in five years into a business and we're the number one player in the market. And by the way, the market that we're in is a national product yeah. of that of that whole country. So from our point of view, it's this is the most special investment opportunity and probably the most special project that I've personally been a part of my entire life. Yeah. And that we might be. <laughs> that way it might be forever is the best thing I've ever been a part of. So we're going for it. 
built a nice list here of assets, 27 farms spread across 6,652 acres, almost 8 million trees, you know, 275 investors committing $35 million of capital. And we're proud of the scale of the business and what we've achieved within the business. You know, receiving awards this year from the Colombian Congress, the Colombian Ag Minister for the best technological innovation in agriculture. All of these things that we're doing are continuously adding value to the business and they serve where we are today and create that platform for where we're going in the future. Absolutely. And, and just to touch on a, a couple of these, a couple of these things. I mean, when you're talking about 6,000 acres of land, you know, I, I say it when we get to go take out investors to farms, but we literally are buying sides of mountains or whole mountains themselves. 6,000 acres, when you put it in perspective, that is a huge, huge land holding, huge. When you're talking about 7 million trees, I mean, that when we started this project to take it back four or five years ago, you know, when we started, we're looking at 300,000 trees, 400,000 trees. We were trying to get to a million trees to be a real player. And now we are that player. We are the guys that everyone else will benchmark themselves to here in the whole country of Colombia. Mm -hmm. Part of some of the questions we see coming in, touch on this slide, we're at 428 full-time employees during the harvest cycle. We'll have about 400 additional workers join us. Our monthly cash burn is about $185,000. And because of the investment, again, we're in a strong cash position, about $7 million that we have on hand right now that we'll be deploying into more assets really over the course of the, the balance of this year. Absolutely. Jumping into where do we go from here? Pillar, basically the business is built on three pillars to simplify things to some extent. Really, it is buy farms, execute on the optimization of those farms so that we're getting the highest quality coffee we can, so that we're getting the most consistent coffee we can, and really have that infrastructure in place so that we're, fr from the time we touch the coffee to the time it reaches the end consumer, we're able to control the quality, control the consistency, and, and, and really scale up there. That's, I guess, what you call our on-the-ground farming operations. As Cole mentioned, one of the big next steps for the business is moving more and more into that vertical integration piece and the roasted, and the roasted coffee sales. Our goal there, and you'll see it as we get through the deck, 30 million pounds of coffee on a roasted basis, selling at about $6.50 a pound going into 2026, which is our targeted exit year for, for our investors. Pillar three is, is really, I think, an exciting one for investors in the sense that they really haven't heard about it before. As Cole mentioned, about 80% of all of the coffee slash cherry slash bean that we pick off the tree, everything we take off the coffee trees, about 80% of it is pulp, skin, mucilage, proteins, water. The history of coffee is that that is used, it's, it's waste. Sometimes it's used as fertilizer. Most of the times it's discarded in an irresponsible manner. For us, fundamentally, this, the idea is it's garbage. How do we turn it into money? The best way we see to do that in the short term is to convert that into vodka, spirits, other consumer products that we're looking for. Adding up these three pillars, where we want to go, what we're looking at for in a 2020 exit, plus 250 million of of revenue when you combine those three channels. Absolutely. And I think just to touch on two things, because we get a lot of questions from our investors about really about pillar two and three, but they're really the same questions that we get answered or get asked every single time. First about roasted coffee sales. What are we trying to do? We're really trying to sell in a B2B format at scale. Mm -hmm. And in to put uh, you know, the price points that Adam is is stating into perspective, how we model is six dollars and fifty cents a pound, inflation adjusted over the forecast period. If you think about if you were to go to, let's say Stomp Town or any of the, let's say the higher end coffee roasters in the United States, and you want to even try to buy a thousand pounds of coffee. Typically, the bidding will be at you know eight dollars to ten dollars a pound. That's what you'll typically see for whole bean coffees. You know what we do is we model this low so that we we set our sales targets for a sales team above that. You know we're not going out to try to sell twenty dollar, but I always like to say it's handlebar mustache guy coffee twenty dollars a pound. We're trying to sell at six dollars and fifty cents a pound, but we're looking to do it at scale. Pillar three is I think where. One, I'm personally the most excited, and 
why I know it's so exciting is we've been chasing this for five years and we've found an outlet, actually a, a couple outlets, but this is the first that we're going to be pushing through that can fundamentally change how coffee is done. It's the business model is not solely grow coffee, process it, sell it. That is the business model for the last 1000 years related to coffee. But we're expanding upon that to say, look, how do you make the most of everything that's within your ecosystem and make the most for investors? And we, and the, I guess the cliche word for that is circular economy, right? We have a tremendous amount of byproduct. When we are modeling in, for instance, all the vodka that we're looking to produce, and we'll go through kind of the ethanol market and what are the potential offloads for ethanol and how vodka is made from ethanol. We can go in, we're going to go into that a little bit more later in the presentation. But what's important to know is we're only modeling in one quarter of the usage product of our byproducts coming off our farms. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the use of capital is doubling up our farm holdings in another area of Colombia so that we have a year round harvest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> When we do so, obviously, we'll have two times the amount of byproduct that we have currently in our current operating nexus of Salgar. When we're setting out our distillery projections for ethanol, we're only modeling from one facility. We'll have four facilities at the end of this capital deployment. So what this assumes is none of this, none of this extra byproduct revenue and the source, basically this, these revenue streams and verticals are going to be put into these financial projections. So what in the effort to kind of show how we're being conservative with financial forecasts, it's very important for, for investors to understand conservative B2B forecast for B2B roasting sales and very conservative usage of our full byproduct resources to create those new vertical revenue channels. Mm -hmm. And to put this, I guess, a little bit more in context, what are we talking about? What's the scale of the vodka operation? When we're running that one facility, which remember Cole said really out of four, mm -hmm. when we're running that at full capacity, we'll be producing about 38,750 milliliter bottles of vodka on a daily basis. So a tremendous amount of byproduct, tremendous amount of product that we're going to have to be able to take to market. That's it's it's the reason why we can come up, we can, we can present such such I think big goals and, and big numbers for, for our investors. Definitely. I think we overpromised a little bit and said we'd only talk for 20 minutes, but I, I think that we're hopefully answering some of the questions. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> up front. <laughs> you know, the, the the team obviously is essential. We're incredibly proud of it. It's it's the guys that are going to get us to the to the goals that we have as as a group. You know, most of you or who have been with us have had a chance to meet Boris Wolner, our CEO, 25 years in agriculture here in Colombia. Cole, you know his story now as the founder and working at, at in in M and A at PwC for almost a decade. Myself working as an SEC capital markets attorney for almost a decade for Fortune 500s. Wall Street banks, taking companies public, et cetera. And we just are proud of the on the ground team that we have from the agronomy levels to our financial department, to Juan Miguel Jaramillo, who's our new COO since, since I guess, 2020 now. That's right. Of um, you know, his experience with Expo Cafe, Cole Cafe, all these companies down here. You know, we've built, I think, the team that we need from a top-down perspective and, and uh, strategic all the way down to growing good coffee perspective that we need to, to, to get to the, the goals that we have. Definitely. And, and to, I guess to put it in a qualitative standpoint, I mean, Adam and I were presenting to the heads of investment banking at Bank Colombia, which is the largest bank here in Colombia, two weeks ago. And I don't like the, you know, if all the management team was with me, and I probably wouldn't be so gracious because I don't want to get big heads on their shoulders. <laughs> but part of our business model is hiring the best guys you can get in the whole country. And that's what we've got. So I remember sitting across from the head of investment banking at Bank Colombia saying, these are the best guys you can buy in Colombia. I'm 100% sure because we've done this round for five years. It took us five years to find the best guys. These are the most talented management team you can have in coffee in the whole country. And if we find more talent, we're going to acquire it. Right. Part of our business model, besides just bringing foreign capital in, is getting the best and the brightest around us that are looking to fundamentally change how coffee is done in Colombia and build the biggest organization and most sophisticated organization that's ever existed in the history of Colombian coffee. But we don't tell all the management team that. If yeah, they're, if they watch they're not watching. <laughs> 
So diving into the terms of the investment, 100 million capital round, we're expecting 25 million in equity, 75 million in debt post raise. So assuming we get all the equity, all the debt will be sitting at about 45% equity, 55% debt. So 60 million of equity total, 75 million of of debt. We're raising the equity in three tranches. It's going to be the first 8.33 million is going to be at a seven and a half percent discount to the base price, which is 1200. The second tranche will be at a three and a half percent discount. And then the, the, the last tranche will be at, at the $1,200 per share. The projections, because of the move farther down the value chain into roasted coffee because of the addition of the byproducts business, we're able to forecast plus 11x multiples on capital because the potential is so strong and also because the valuation of the company right now is, I would say, conservative or even underpriced. Sure, sure. I, I think I think that's a very important concept. I'm going to put in my investor independent hat on for a minute. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at pre-IPO companies, so, so we're four years out pre-IPO company, and theoretically, this will be our third year of public company audit, right? So a, a public accounting, PCOB certified auditor, this is going to be our third year. Really, we're meeting all the requirements now to be a public company next year. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to, theoretically, we throw up on the board. I think we'd be putting, we'd throw away a lot of value by doing that. Obviously, we're not going to do it. But theoretically, some of the companies that you could see as comparable companies are smaller than we are today. So we're already at the public market level. To have a pre-market balance sheet business, and I've talked about this on investor calls before, we are a heavy collateralized business. We are not a tech company with an algorithm in 12, 25-year-olds sitting in a basement valued at $452 million, right, with a balance sheet of negative $1 million in equity right? This is a real balance sheet business. To get in at sub $100 million on an individual LP level is, I, I hope that investors will see that and say, I'm incredibly excited to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. It's very, very unique opportunity, I believe. I don't see it in the market hardly ever. All right. We talked about this. We'll explain the pillars briefly because we, we did, I think, a, a pretty thorough job previously, but again, pillar one is, and the use of capital is finished buying and some additional farms in Salgar. We're basically almost done. The goal is to get to 2,000 active hectares in each of our core regions. We're almost there in Salgar. A big part of the capital that we're bringing in will be used to expand into the Candillo region, which is an area south of where we currently are. The main reason I get this question a lot is it's not just a scale play, it's a year round harvest play. The new areas that we're looking at have harvested in the spring, whereas for us now, we're principally a, a fall harvest company. So to even out some of that seasonality, it's important us for, for us to do that expansion. It's important us to have that that nexus around the country and really diversify our, our production some. Definitely. And one more thing to touch on here now, a lot of potential investors or current investors are probably seeing a lot of the videos we've been pumping out. We try to be as transparent as possible so you can see everything we do, especially in this area, because this is what investors see as say, pillar one, this is this is what you guys traditionally do. Just to touch on processing, you know, our infrastructure is one, custom made, no one else in the world has it, and it's the best processing infrastructure that exists globally, not just Colombia, globally. Mm -hmm. We we bring in equipment what is the best in class from all over the world. So which means a lot of this equipment isn't made here in Colombia. Some of it is, some of it we have it custom made, some of it we import from Brazil, some of it from Spain, some of it from Northern Europe. It depends on what who is the best manufacturer. And then we use agro-industrial engineers here. For instance, Boris and Juan Miguel are both ag, and, uh, and ag industrial engineers. And we custom make basically projects around use cases of what do we exactly need? What does the market need to be the best in, in the processing of coffee cherries, in the processing of parchment, which goes into green coffee. So this is not just a throw money at some farms, put some trees in there, do what everyone else has done for a hundred years. If we only did this piece, we're already light years ahead of everyone else due to the innovation that we do at the tree level and the nursery level, the innovation at the processing and infrastructure level, and honestly, at the quality control level. The guys who cup our coffees every day, they're all the equivalent of sommeliers. If, if 
buyers and investors are familiar with the wine market. There is a sommelier license in coffee, and everyone who cups our coffee and does quality control are sommeliers of coffee. I think, Cole, the, the point you just mentioned, you know, one of the popular questions is why don't, why doesn't somebody come in, splash half a billion dollars at the market and just do exactly what you're doing? We're not saying that it's impossible to duplicate, but we have a pretty good runway Absolutely. because of the customization, because of the team build out, because of the quality control, just operating in the market, being able to find deals, building a reputation in the market where we are, call it a known buyer where people are now bringing us farm acquisitions and opportunities, whereas it was a different scenario five years ago of going Definitely. and hunting opportunities. So from a competitive advantage standpoint, I like where we currently stand. Definitely. Definitely. Here, briefly, you can see the expansion. Basically, each color signifies a different year. As, as, as we started the presentation, you know, it was maybe thinking small and then seeing the opportunity in front of us and really running with it. We've done a substantial amount of acquisition over the, the, the last year and a half, two years or so. And now we're comfortable doing it. You know, it becomes a, how do we franchise this essentially and duplicate this model around the country? And we're seeing those opportunities to do it. And we expect really some, some nice acquisitions in these new areas of the country we're talking about before, before year end. Definitely. And to elaborate what Adam is saying here is, you know, especially the note on we're getting deal flow to us now. You know, when we first started this project, and I remember negotiating what is in the green on these files here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took, you got to meet with someone's cousin, uncle, brother, grandmother, son, daughter to get through because they're owned by family. So it takes a very long time to get through these deals. Now people are sending us deal flow. And when we have capital available, we can take advantage of the opportunities that are granted to us. Now, one thing that Adam has touched upon is our goal is 2,000 active coffee hectares in Salgar and 2,000 active coffee hectares in Kindio. Now, Every acquisition that we've done in 2022 that you'll see in purple, purplish pink on the coloring on this map has been done at a budget that is below, materially below what we budgeted for in this presentation. Mm -hmm. So that, that is incredibly important. So when we have cash on hand and we can take advantage or arbitrage deal flow when we can get it, it's very important that we maintain that kind of what I would call is an m and department within the green coffee company to scale in an both in arbitrage and in, in, in a clever and let's say holistic manner. And in this year, from these acquisitions that we've seen, we've got them at incredible, incredible pricing. Mm -hmm. So our goal of 2000 in Salgar, 2000 in Kindio might actually be increased by the time that we fully deploy this capital, because right now we're doing excellent versus these budgets. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The other thing that I think is important as we talk about our production, what we're doing at the farm level is to understand the coffee cherry buying program that we have. It supports the other farmers who sell us their coffee, but the thesis really is we want to add to our production by buying high quality coffee from the other farmers who are around us because we see the potential to frankly just sell more. You know, we've really ramped up the coffee buying program this year. I think in the last month and a half, we've done about 360,000 kilograms of coffee cherry that we've purchased. We fell into some arbitrage situations where we we're able to find new points around our nexus where we're able to buy coffee. But really this is when we have cash on hand, just like with the invest in the thesis around buying land, when we have cash on hand, we know how to put it to work and get a good return on, on capital for investors. And one of, one of the ways to do it is not just focus on what are we growing on our own farms, but what can we buy around us at a good price that we can immediately resell and run through our own processing facilities. It's perfect. That's perfect. I think we're doing, let's keep going. Let's, let's keep, keep cruising. Time. Pillar keep cruising. two, the, yeah. the, the, the roasted coffee sale. Cool. Why don't you Sure. So the, the vertical, this is the vertical integration, right? And, and probably most people say, well, you can sell green coffee. It's a commodity. Is it difficult to sell roasted coffee? In reality, there's, there's a floor on roasted coffee pricing. We've been looking at roasted coffee. We sold roasted coffee in the U S for the last three years. We just done it on a small scale. You know, what you see in the United States or really any developed coffee market is there's always the floor, right? Once you go to green, so you have commodity prices that fluctuate every day. And then once you get into, let's say it's a consumer product, there's still a base floor. So what we see in the market is there's a massive gap for farm 
or, or I'd say direct origin coffees that are farm direct, transparent, and they do sustainability initiatives that buyers actually want to see. Not that they're spending a bunch of money on marketing and saying they're doing them, but they can actually back them up. The things that we do every single day, right? They want to see the videos. They want to be able to come see the teams at the farms. And really in Colombia, there's hardly anyone doing what we're doing on, a, let's say, an ESG and a sustainability basis that we'll talk about later. So really the way I see of moving from, okay, I need to, let's say I have 20 million pounds of, of green coffee today. Me and Adam could liquidate that through our management team probably in the course of a day for cash. Coffee is that liquid. In the roasted market, it basically has one more step, which is processing of green coffee into a roasted fashion, bagging and selling at scale. Now, who are clients going to be? Clients are going to be large institutions, food supplier. Let's take your, let's say your U.S. Foods, Shamrock Foods. Uh, institutions such as offices can be churches, can be office groups, but guys who buy in bulk for usually probably most likely regional deals. Where we're looking at setup operations, either in Texas or Florida, we'll be, able, we'll be able to concentrate holistically on these institutional groups. And remember that our price points are not, let's say, optimistic at all. Actually, our price points that we'll give our sales team will be significantly higher than what we present to investors. Additionally, one other thing to think about is we put heavy, heavy marketing budgets into these forecasts for these sales teams, right? So for instance, just for just for the roasted coffee division, we put 10% of sales as a marketing budget for a B2B sales offload for roasted coffee selling at $6.50 a pound, which is which be way under what I'd expect a, a dedicated sales team to be able to do. Mm -hmm. But really the, the focus of this is offloading B2B roasted at scale for a little bit more margin that you'd see off a green sale. And in reality, what that does is not only gives you a higher margin price and a higher gross margin over time, but it gets you out of that cyclical nature of the green coffee commodity market. If you're only selling green and that's your whole business model, you will be correlated to that market no matter what. You can sell specialty at a premium above it, but you'll, your end sales price will always be dictated at least a positive correlated, maybe not one to one, but uh, there will be a direct correlation to what's trading on an ICE market of commodity C versus what you're trying to sell at your green coffee that harvest year. So, what do we have to do to realize this pillar? We have we have uh, quotes for for the roasted the, the roasting facility uh, budgeted for the U.S. We're targeting Florida and Texas right now. Basically, the the task is identify the commercial real estate, which you know we know we can do, and then we've already working with providers in Germany for the equipment. The same providers who provide the equipment for Kraft and Nestle for their own roasting facilities. What kind of scale are we looking for? Three point two million pounds per month of roasted coffee as we get the operation kind of to its full tilt in Q two of twenty twenty four, and we have our own facility. I think it's important to note that we're basically not sitting around and waiting until Q2 2024. Yes. We have white labelers that we work with right now. We are expecting really a large push into the roasted coffee coming up, call it the tail end of this year and early into next year where our investors are really gonna start seeing some production coming out of the roasted. And the idea is get ourselves in the market, start building some contracts, start building some reputation. And then we're shifting those contracts from white labeling third-party production over to our own facility as we as we transition, as we get the facility on the ground. But this is one our, our team is ready to do. And as Cole mentioned, even at, at low price per sale, really a dollar fifty, two dollars under what we're seeing for actual market price. If when when we get to these figures, you know, we're over two hundred million dollars in and revenue and, and growing from there as we buy more farms, deploy more capital, continue to grow here in Colombia, expand our buying program. Perfect. Pillar three, this is where we get into the, the vodka, the byproducts, the spirit production, as we mentioned before, 80% of everything gets wasted. Fundamentally for, for us, this is take garbage, make money on it for investors. What's the downside if we if we don't do this? It's we sell pure ethanol, we sell it in country. We're going to turn all of this byproduct into something and you're going to see it represented in the financial statements and in your investment. But we 
know that we can do better for you if we're creating end-to-end -end -end consumer products. And we see the technology that's been around for, I don't know, a thousand years in terms yes. of distillation, <laughs> making vodka. Yes. It's really turning all of this into ethanol, adding water, creating a product that we're selling on a really B2B wholesale from the model, but that can go B2C and where we can see some, some real upside. Definitely. And one question we get from investors is about ethanol itself, yeah. because they might not be familiar with the ethanol market. Ethanol is a commodity, right? So you can use ethanol to make gasoline. It goes basically the levels of pricing will be ethanol, gasoline, then like jet fuel, and then pricing that you'd see with something like a corn ethanol that would go into making a vodka that's in the United States. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know how vodka is made, you know, vodka is just pure ethanol, which some people might call moonshine, right? And adding distilled water down to a proof level that you want the vodka to be typically 80 proof, so 40% alcohol. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a quite simplified process. Uh, the, the offload of ethanol, especially as a commodity, whether it's jet fuel or as a pure crude, is, is quite simple. You could sell it all here in Colombia. In the instance that we wanted to sell pure ethanol, Echo Patrol is the largest petroleum company here in Colombia. You could offload the whole batch the same manner that we'd offload coffee. So it is an incredibly liquid commodity, just like green coffee is. Mm -hmm. And it sounds crazy to say, but we talk about it all the time. Really, the coffee coming from our business could become the byproduct. You know, the, yes. the 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 potential for this side of the business. If you just think about, we have four times as much byproduct as we do coffee. If we're monetizing that, if we're finding these consumer channels, the coffee becomes by nature the byproduct. It's really, if somebody's familiar with oil and gas space, it's you have your crude oil, then you have your natural gas, petroleum, all of the offspring of that of that that product where you're starting to see value created across the, the channel so that, again, everything you create becomes a value. Absolutely, absolutely. Where are we going there? As I mentioned, 38,000 bottles of vodka a day is the capacity for the facility. We're building 6.4 million USD in terms of investment. We'll build that literally right next to the facilities we already have here in Salgar. So there's no real acquisition that needs to go on. All of that distillation will happen here. And we're looking at upwards of 50 million in, in revenue going into 2026. Just from this piece of the byproduct business. As Cole mentioned, we're going to have at a minimum three other facilities with exactly the same amount of capacity that we're continuing to explore more optionality for. So just looking at the vodka, you know, we're talking about 50 million in, in, in revenue on an annualized basis. Absolutely. With huge margins because we don't have any additional costs. Totally. Every everything that is a byproduct is by nature already paid for in the coffee production it, itself. Yes. And actually right now it has a cost. Yeah. You know, right now it's a negative revenue, right? So just the human capital involved with just moving it off site or make it into fertilizer, there's no direct revenue offset to that. So right now it's just purely a cost. Uh, and just so investors know, you know, vod I, I spoke about it early in the presentation, but vodka and ethanol is only one avenue. Mm -hmm. We're looking at dried cascara, which <laughs> is dried, dried coffee, cherry. We're looking at things like energy production, like biofuels and whatnot. Right now, from all the studies that we've completed with the University of Los Andes, so for the last six months we've done a we've done a, a study with what is the the best and the brightest ag university here in Colombia called the Los Andes University. And ethanol came out to be the best use case for our coffee cherries. So that is the first use case that we're going to roll out for our investment for the green coffee company. But there will be more use cases in the future. Just like I said at the beginning, that 75% of our byproduct is not forecasted into any of our financial forecasts. We will make it management's duty to make sure we have a use for every bit of this byproduct in the future. And those will be exciting new things coming in as the year goes on. I think your point is, is a good one that this, this is not a, can you make vodka out of the byproduct? Of it's, we know, we know we can, we've worked with our own team of, of research scientists here at Columbia. This has been studied by German research scientists. The reason that we think that nobody's really dedicated the time and energy to this is 
essentially a, a scale question. The, the byproduct, you have about 24 hours to, to turn it into something be, before it starts to, to, to basically rot. And, and people are not operating at the scale that we are when it comes to farms and even the processing facility where you're actually even preserving the, the cherry in a way that could be later turned into something. So it's, again, a we have a running start on, on a lot of folks who might look at this in the future. That's exactly right. Exit plan financial projections, how do we get to the 11x plus return that we're looking at for investors? I think as we've talked about with the investors before, you know, we really have two options, sell the business or take it public. Our modeling, as you'll see on the on the slides, you know, we're expecting to do about $60 million in net income in 2026. The way we've modeled this in really an IPO or a corporate buyout situation, expecting really that a corporate buyout would be, be more if we have the optionality for an IPO is 20 times net income, which is really a, a PE multiple of, of 20X, which is the historical average for the last 50 years in the S&P 500 index. So what we've said is we're not going to value ourselves like a tech company. We're not going to do these huge multiples. We're going to say, what is the, what is the multiple that the Amazons of the world could, could, could get? And even they're way higher, but mm -hmm. what, what does the S and P say companies can, can, can really do on an average basis? So again, in the interest of being conservative, as you'll see on the next slide, we think that the potential is a, a lot higher, you know, from a purely, purely, financial standpoint, we should not be trading in the same world as the apples. Just by nature, they're not going to have the potential for growth on a percentage basis as we are as a, I guess, call it a relatively smaller company mm -hmm. that can multiply, can multiply capital. If we put in what the real projections could be, if we look at something like the Russell 2000, where companies that have achieved net income are trading at 65 times earnings, everybody on the call would laugh at us. So we, we keep it to, to 20X to, to stay in line with the S&P 500. I, th I think what's important, well, a, co a couple highlights from this slide is, you know, we're looking at having 60 million of investment after this offering, another, third, another 25 tacked onto the additional 35. If we're doing 60 million in net income, which we think is, is very reasonable, we're returning 100% on equity on an annualized basis. If you compare that to the other companies that you see on this slide, the Black Rifles of the World, the Reborn Coffee, Nusi, which is a coffee roaster out of Austin, West Rock, again, a distribution roasting company, all these other companies that are, I guess, call it comparables or playing in the same space. You know, these guys have gotten huge market valuations. Most of them are losing money and all of their price to earning ratios are many multiples on what we're looking at. The other theme, and I think the takeaway here is, a lot of people say, can you get to an IPO? Can you get to an exit? If you just stack up our business next to the companies here that are already public, as Cole mentioned earlier, with the audited financials, with going through the process of getting kind of all our ducks in a row to go public, really we could be in a position to do it next year if we wanted to, but we don't wanna leave value on the table that we could be creating as a private company. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Financial summary, I love it. I'll go through it. Um, I think what the, the point of the previous slide is to get investors comfortable with uh, the exit projections. I agree with everything Adam is saying. You know, If we did it at our real projections, what we'd expect to see, I'd expect to see multiples way higher than what we presenting here, mm -hmm. right? And especially in, even with current dips you see in the market, you should for a, for what we'd see as a small cap, we'd be a sub two billion dollar company. We shouldn't be compared to GE, right? We we mm -hmm. shouldn't be, right? It's just not it's not the same blue sky valuation that you'll get of what's the growth of GE's future versus what can we do here in in Colombia. And obviously, when we were to IPO, the use of capital for that was not just be okay. Let's make sure we have a liquidity event for investors. Really, what it is is show what we've done in this raise and replicate it over more areas of Colombia. Have more control over the coffee production. Do more great things at Origin that could create a better ecosystem, a better story, and push more or both byproduct and roasted coffee through that vertical integration. And in 
once that product is basically that model is proven, it's very easy to, to convince and for people to understand the blue sky industrial institutional nature of how do you move, go from placing $100 million to saying we need to place 500 right? And that's the IPO scenario. From here, I think the biggest things to point on uh, on this financial summary, really, I want to retouch on the conservative nature of the valuations, right? The conservative nature of the management projections so that investors understand how we model cash flows. So re refresh back on roasted coffee. Our goal is $6.50 $6 a pound roasted, right? Selling at scale. Our goal for vodka Right now, $8 a bottle with 20% of that sales price allocated just for pure burns related to marketing, not counting SGNA, not counting all the costs that goes in associated with the CapEx, but $8 a bottle, inflation adjusted. That's that's our goal, right? So I think the most important thing here for when investors are doing their diligence is to understand the assumptions that we make and say, hey, do these B2B revenue assumptions make sense? If I was to look at the model, can, can they look aggressive, right? If I was an investor, those are the things I would ask for. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to ask, but those are the primary questions we get on, on this slide here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. We save it for last, but it's one of the things that we're probably the most proud of within the business is everything that we're doing from a sustainability standpoint. You know, we could go on and on about this. We have lots of videos out there uh, so so that investors and, and folks watching could see this. Some of the things we're really proud of, I think, are bringing a new mindset, like I said, fresh eyes, fresh capital into the market and doing things that have really never existed in the history of coffee here in Colombia. Pension plans, health coverage, formal banking for almost all of our employees continuing to grow that. One I'm particularly proud of, this year, we will plant an additional 2.5 million trees across our farms. The whole team that's leading that effort in our greenhouses are part of a program called Single Mothers Heads of Family. Those are mothers who, as, as it sounds, you know, are, are in charge of running their household, their children's depend, their children depend on them. It's a program that is giving equal opportunity to, to those folks so that they can really be in leadership roles and, and find 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 work and, and be able to support the families that they're they're in charge of supporting the the the, other, the last one i'll mention from a sustainability one that that i love is the environmental standpoint and what we're doing with the processing facilities the technology that that cole mentioned this year the expectation is through the processing in our facilities we'll save 21 million liters of water versus what we would have used if we were processing the same amount of coffee through traditional technology. All of this employment benefits, the single mothers program, the savings for water, the benefits for the env en environment, all of that multiplies, duplicates, et cetera. As we continue to grow, we grow to new regions. That means more jobs, more opportunities, more of an environmental impact. And as an investor, this is, necessary and essential for continuing the value creation of the business. Frankly, if we didn't do it, your investment wouldn't be as valuable. Absolutely. And, if, and to finalize on one thing, I mean, personally, you know, there, there's a lot going on with ESG investment. A lot of it we think is kind of silly going on. People are saying greenwashing, doing things they don't want to, they, they're not really doing. No. For us, it's really about, you know, we don't have a mandate that says we have to do this social this social initiative, this governance thing, or we have to tick boxes. We do not tick boxes, right? What we're trying to do is build a business that we're all proud to be upon and proud to be a part of. And we're doing things that we want to do with around people that we think are generally great people, right? And in, in a building an ecosystem around us that we think is the lasting business, it is best for both the capitalistic nature of the business, but as the industry as a whole. So it's not about just, okay, hopefully we can get this impact fund related to check this box and then we put it on a resume. It's really everything we do is centered around the nature of, does this make the business generally more valuable? Mm -hmm. Is the ecosystem getting better? Are we developing the industry? Are we developing our people? Are we developing our own portion of the industry, our small piece of the co global coffee business? Is it becoming more valuable? Perfect.
we said we would do 20 and we did 50. So <laughs> we're appreciative of the patience for everybody. We want to get to all the questions. We've got a good list here. Again, really appreciate the patience and, and sticking with us. A lot of information, but we really want to take this opportunity, paint the picture for the existing investors who have been with us and seen the development over time, and obviously share a story that we're really proud of with people who are new to us. Perfect. So we'll get started on questions. So the first one, is there a dividend on old or new shares? Yeah, as a reminder, as we mentioned in the investment summary, we have a 6% accumulating preferred dividend for all the investors. So every year that you're invested, it, your, your investment is growing by 6%. So if you put in 100,000, every year you're adding 6,000 to that position. The next question for us becomes, do we pay the dividend or what is our, better said, what is the best way to exercise our obligation to you as investors to grow your investment as much as possible and also fit in line with our fiduciary duty of making sure that we're making you as much money as possible. A lot of the discussion we've had today was, can we, can we find opportunities, which I think we're showing that we can from an acquisition standpoint, from an investment standpoint, where it's more valuable to you that we reinvest the capital in the business versus paying out a dividend on one hand and then raising money on the other hand to acquire more acquisitions, et cetera. So some of the acquisitions that Cole mentioned to you that we're talking about, the expansions into Candio, for example, that deal were, were we have, we have the purchase agreement in hand, and we're looking at basically one third to market price of what that deal could look like, you know, or what it should like look Definitely. like if we were at, at, at a market price. So now we're looking at, you know, is it more valuable to have cash and invest that in the business and, and get that acquisition to the investors on a long-term basis? Or should we be paying out money and then raising money to be able to complete that acquisition? To us, the, the answer seems seems pretty clear. It's also, I think, worth noting that it, th this is not a, as Cole mentioned, a, a tech company where we're burning cash. We don't expect to be profitable until 10 years after the IPO. You know, we're expecting, as I mentioned, 10 times revenue from last year, profitability going at, into, the, into 2023, finishing up 2022 with a nice EBITDA position around, around $2 million. So that in itself is, is I think, quite rare and is going to be reflected in the long-term value creation for investors. Fundamentally, the dividend question will always be, what is the best use of capital for making your investment as, as valuable as possible? Perfect. Okay. What dynamics is the company seeing in connection with the new president of Columbia? Go ahead. Okay. So high level, what we're seeing in Colombia is no, nothing negative has come out since we have a new president of Colombia related to our business. Actually, we're seeing quite the opposite of seeing very positive things come out uh, related to the new president. We're seeing ag taking lead and center as being the most important industry in Colombia. They're heavily pushing ag to get preferential treatment, whether that's, you know, almost interest-free bank loans, it's subsidies related to pricing, could be subsidies related to input pricing, related to fertilizers and whatnot. We're seeing a lot of initiatives being talked about to support the ag sector. Now, us being the largest player in coffee is an advantageous position, right? So let's talk about things that have actually happened since he's come in and say, or since Gustavo Petro came in and say, what what is he actually put in that says that you can actually opine upon, not just talking in the background? First that you saw last week come in with the subsidy on gas prices is going to get eliminated. Here in Colombia, that is a huge deal. So they put a cap on the gas price here in Colombia, so it never exceeds a certain amount. What that does, it subsidizes drivers in Colombia if the gas price goes at an international, obviously it's a floating value of petroleum prices, if it gets too high, they subsidize it, right? And it's going to cost a tremendous amount of money this year due to all the Ukrainian and Russian issues as gas prices have skyrocketed. They're going to eliminate that. From, uh, I would say from a populist basis, that is an incredibly unpopular measure, right? From a capitalist basis, I would say it's incredibly positive for us. 
the, you know, the appointment of many of their ministers that say Ocampo is the head of the finance ministry. He was probably like the number, if you put it in football terms, he's like the number one draft pick of people that you could say for a pro-economic mm -hmm. capitalist government. What do you want to see? Who do you want to see get picked? I would say Ocampo probably from every, I'd say every banker, everyone who works in the financial services industry, everyone who works in big business in Colombia wanted to see Ocampo get placed. And he did. So the appointment of the ministers that we've seen in the real power, I would say the power positions in Colombia, we're not seeing anything that really makes us too nervous. The, the one statistic that came out a couple of weeks ago, which again goes to your point of what is actually going on. We are not the only ones making big bets on Colombia. In the first six months of 2022, $9.8 billion of foreign direct investment came into Colombia. Remember, too, that throughout this process leading up to the election, Gustavo Petro, the current president, was the favorite the whole time. So international markets saw this change in administration coming and still saw the, the, the upside of investing in Colombia. How does that compare to the past? $9.8 billion is the largest investment ever into Colombia in the first six months of the year on record. It's more than double the 2021 investment of $4.3 billion. So you're seeing a lot of people who are saying, we understand who this guy is. We understand who this administration is, what's going on here. We want to make those, those bets. And we're really betting on, on a country rather than any one individual or, or what might happen for any four-year period in the in the country. So reinforces the point that there's a lot of smart people, a lot of smart money coming into the country, making big investments, and, and we want to be right there with them. Exactly. Perfect. How many direct employees and contractual workers are now with the company? I can take you with that. Take that one. That's this what I got earlier. Oh, yes. Remember we got so. Ah, yes. Okay. So just to recap about, yep. about 450 uh, full-time during harvest, we'll probably get up to about 800 during the harvest period this year. Okay, we've already touched on indirect, indirect labor cost. Yep. That Q&A has been done. How much byproduct results from the production of alcohol? Randy, that's the 49 million, 50 million of revenue that we're expecting for 2026. Obviously scaling up over that, over the next four years. That's right. And remember that 75% of our byproduct is not factored into our projections. That'll be blue sky revenue that we create over the next year as we push out more distribution channels. Okay, in pillar two, how do you project the competition with well-established coffee brands? It's a great question, Adriana. So in reality, what we've seen over the last five years of testing the market, talking to buyers, talking to sellers, is that there's a massive gap. I, I think I said it a little bit before earlier in the presentation of that farm direct. The issue with Colombian providers today, and even Brazilian providers that have significantly larger landholders than Colombian, is they can't scale and provide the volumes that buyers want. So if you want to go farm direct and say, I want the origin story, I want the sustainability story, I want homogeneous population of beans that have homogeneous quality. So it's the same every time I get it. You can only go to the biggest guys in the country. And they can't meet the volume demands of these clients. So when we talk about the volumes that we're doing and a high level stat that me and Adam were talking about this morning, yeah. at the end of this raise and the deployment of this capital, we're looking Looking to do about 49 million pounds of coffee annually coming off our farms and what we buy from the immediate surrounding farmers. 49 million pounds of coffee would be almost one day of all the coffee that's drank on earth every year, right? So we would be one day of production of the whole world, just one out of 365, would be coming from green coffee company farms. So it would be obviously a massive achievement, but to touch back on how how does a well-established brand compete with that? Right now, they don't have, when they don't have the story, they don't have the impact, they don't have the farm traceable quality, and we know where they get the quality or the quality of their coffee from, the quantities of their coffee from, and frankly, they're insufficient, and I would say 
not inept, but not as quality, high quality infrastructure as we have. So their product quality that's coming off from Colombian providers, typically in the United States, will always be lower than what we have. And our goal is to sell a higher quality product with a better story, more traceability, and really our sales target is lower than the guy next door. So I, I think that should be really that's the overall strategy of how the financial modeling is done. But in reality, the the actual results I'd expect to exceed what we've modeled here. Should I take the next two? I read ahead. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Regarding pillar three, byproducts basically, is there any other products in Colombia? How would it compare? Absolutely zero. There's no Colombian produced, I'll call it home homegrown uh, product here here in Colombia. So this would be a new market entrant. We'd also, of course, be looking for to do a lot of sales on a, on a global basis, but from a purely, what is the competitive landscape in Colombia? Absolutely zero competing products. Scott, good to see you here. Uh, see your question, basically why, why reinvest? You know, I think it's a, a question of fundamentally, if, if you're sitting on additional capital, what, what do you what do you do with it, right? It, there's there's a value in not having to diligence new opportunities. There's a value in buying kind of known commodities. But from a pure mathematical standpoint, you know our Series B investors came in at about seven hundred a share, and we're expecting then about a seven x return on investment with these new streams of of revenue, the roasted channel, the byproducts, the projections have gone to 11X on new capital. So at the 1200 per share price, we're already talking about 11X on that. So if you do a weighted average of previous investment, investment now, you're more in the, I guess, call it 13, 13X range of potential returns on a, on a full in investment basis. So it's really, you know, what is the best opportunity for the capital that you have available? And we hope that, frankly, it's, it's, it's what we're doing here at, at GCC. Do you own the farms and equipment or is this type of leasehold? Every, everything is owned. Simply, simply stated, everything is is owned. I assume copies of this presentation recording will be sent to us investors after the presentation. Absolutely, absolutely. So after the presentation, uh, Josh Siegelbaum will be sending out the recap or the, the the review for everybody. Any questions you have, obviously, if we don't get to them all, or you have further questions. Always feel free to, uh, to send us emails at investorrelations at legacygroup.co. Always. Any questions investors have, potential or current investors, feel free to email us. And we can we can make this presentation available, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, went into the calculation of selecting Florida, Texas for U.S. locations of roasting facilities. Ease of doing business, access to ports, access for our management team, prime markets for us in the U.S. really with a... Colombian-based product, Colombian, you know, call it uh, target. That, that's the wrong way to say it, of a, of a target audience, but a, an appeal to to Latin communities in 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 Florida, Texas, primarily. It's really logistically what's easiest, what's the best for doing business, and where are our target customers most likely to be, and where can we get easy distribution throughout the throughout the country. That's right. Fundamentally, that's right. But I would say one of the biggest ones, just to elaborate on Adam's point a little bit more, is really the proximity, not just to ports, but to coffee ports. Mm -hmm. There's there's about there's six to 10 ports in the United States that really matter related to coffee. And most of them are located in that southeast and eastern coast, besides the ports uh, on the west coast in, in California and in the north near New York. Uh, we all the ports that we really like to operate through that we're most comfortable with really are in that southeast region, and that'll be a large target area for us, either whether we pick Houston or most likely Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, I'm looking at current coffee futures on the ICE in CME Globex. I see current prices around 250 a pound, peaking at 225 in December 2022, and steadily declining in 2000. Uh, uh, Two dollars and three cents in September 2024. How does this relate to projected sales price? And how do you hedge? I think the most important thing to think about green coffee pricing is I think hedging is is your is your question. One thing to think about is how does green coffee currently get sold today? Green coffee in Colombia gets sold at a premium. 
right? A premium to market pricing. So let's say today uh, in the instance that the first price we used here, Chris, is $2.15 a pound. Typically, you'll receive a premium of 50 to 80 cents above that by delivering FOB to uh, the most common ports are Buenaventura on the West End Coast or on the Northern Coast is Cartagena. You know, every time you trade green coffee, you'll trade at a pricing above that. You know, the pricing that we see today, all the financial projections were updated as of the day the financial projections went out, which would have been 10 days ago. <laughs> you know, so all, you can go you can go through and see on that final page of the presentation, the financial modeling, the exact pricing that, that we put in there. So it would, have been the, it would have been the pricing from 10 days ago that we would have utilized. Mm -hmm. For as far as hedging, one of the most important things to think about from our transition from green to roasted is a natural product hedging. It's not a financial hedge. It's a it's a, like a product in development of a vertical integration hedge. Once you move into that roasted product, suddenly you're in a consumer product space with which will naturally have a natural floor where large providers will provide massive quantities at basically a, a, a minimum pricing, and it'll get you out of that volatility of the C market pricing. So I would say from, if you're looking at it from a derivative risk perspective of the company or a hedging risk perspective of the company, I'd expect within two years, we have de-risked almost entirely from C market valuation uh, beta. Mm -hmm. And in relation, oh, the last point was on currency. Chris, you have an FX currency hedge question. You know, our, again, our product is denominated in USD. Our costs are denominated a lot in COP. Most, most of our investors are US focused. So they want to make sure that, you know, the cash flow is coming in USD. We have two things focused on, or two things to answer that. One is coffee is always traded in USD. So you're always going to have a USD offload. And as we move further into roasting, whether, and, and the byproduct sales, which is the vodka or the sale of cascara or the sale of ethanol, also USD based, you're also naturally hedging your cash flows with a USD revenue source. I could take a shot at Flora's question. Did I hear it right that GCC is the only coffee company in the world producing byproducts from coffee production? What we've seen is there are other companies that are producing products using the byproducts. For example, there's some companies that are making vodka or drinks or using them as antioxidants or tea. The fundamental weakness that all of those companies have is they don't control any of their own supply. Compare that to what we're doing here in Colombia with you know, almost 2,000 hectares currently in Salgar and all the expansion that we're doing. Those guys have that fundamental weakness that at any point that supply can go away. And actually, we've talked to people who are facing that issue. A lot of the supply is coming from, I would call it, undependable sources. If we can control our own supply, we can get a big competitive leg up in the, in the market. Absolutely. Okay, I want let's answer this one. Sure. Present, this presentation mentions becoming the world's largest producer of Arabica coffee. How close are we now? How close will be after this capital raise? So to recap, today we are the largest producer in Colombia today. Mm -hmm. Coffee or Colombian coffee, they're the number two provider, biggest producer of Arabica coffee in the world today, behind Brazil. The only farms that are larger than Colombia farms are in Brazil. What we see for the top players in Brazil is a, a hectare level of active coffee land between five and 6,000 hectares is where we'd see the absolute top players. So if you want to be the largest in the world, you need to be between five and a half and six and a half thousand hectares, active hectares to be the biggest in the world. Where we'll be at this raise, how we've, how we've modeled this out is 4,000 active hectares, which would put us probably five, six times what our mirrors competitor will be here in Colombia, but will be slightly under what you'd see in Brazil. Now, one thing to keep in mind that Matt, uh, Adam talked about earlier is we are still buying farms at below what we've budgeted for within this presentation. Obviously, if we continue to do that, we could potentially have materially more hectares than we've active coffee hectares than we presented within this file. That'll get us closer to that number one position. Mm -hmm. But where we would be at is by far we would be untouchable, basically, in Colombia. The only there will only be a few minor probably can count them on one hand players in Brazil who could be slightly larger than us, depending on what, how much arbitrage we can get and how close we can get to their figures. But it would only take a small amount of capital to surpass them. We're going to go for it, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, <laughs> totally. totally. <laughs>
Okay. What's the, I'll take this one because sure. it's modeling question. What's the rate of inflation incorporated into the financial projections? That, that will all be on the financial projection slide as well. Uh, this will all be on, I believe we use the most recent macroeconomic indices, yeah. I believe of JP Morgan or, or one of the big banks to do that. But it would just be, I believe it was somewhere between two and 4%, depending on which year. Obviously, we have a higher inflation case here within the, the near term, which we've used macroeconomic from some of the largest economists in the world for what's going to happen with U.S. inflation here over the next forecast period of four to five years. Mm -hmm. Is there a deadline to invest? As I mentioned earlier, we have the three tranches. To get the best possible pricing, you need to get in on this first 8.3 million of the raise. I think as of the time we're talking right now, we've got commitments of 1.4, 1.5 million. For perspective, the last in the Series B, when we had call it three and a half, three million left, we, we, we had commitments come in in about a week to 10 days. So the advice is always... If you like it, you see you see the potential to do it as as fast as you as you can to get the best possible pricing. If you miss the first tranche, you know we'll have the two additional tranches. It's it's slightly less uh, discount percentages, but now is the time to really maximize the the value. Exactly, it won't get any cheaper than it is right now. Yes, for sure, that's true. Um, okay, that's a good question. How much of your own money have you invested? Also, how is this structured as an investment in a Colombian company? Question mark. You want to take? Sure. So today, between Cole and I, we have two point four million dollars of our own money invested, which of course we know is important and 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 showing that we believe in what we're doing. I think one that investors traditionally like is to know that we also have. About two million dollars of friend and family money. So from wives to parents to uncles to aunts to people we grew up our whole lives. You know, I think that not to say any one dollar is more important than another, but to show that you know the the people you're seeing at this table, the team that we've put together, we have a lot of people that we feel feel very responsible to and have full and complete expectations to execute on on the goals we're setting forth for for all of you. How's this structure as an investment in a Colombian company? It's actually a U.S.-based investment. So it's a U.S. company that you're investing in that owns Colombian assets. It would be structured exactly the same as if you invested in Apple. So tax consequences are the same. You pay taxes on dividends and capital gains. No different from, from investing in a U.S.-based company. Lots of questions. Lots of questions here at the end. I think we're going to do probably two questions more, and then we'll wrap it up, and then we'll uh, we'll make a note of all these questions and make sure where we get back to investors because I don't think we'll be able to wrap this up within a, a reasonable time <laughs> a timeline. We got like thirty questions. Yeah, like so thirty people... questions here. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go through some of these quickly because uh, that we can knock them off quick. Is the investment uh, limited to accredited investors only? It is. It is on there. So you need to be an accredited investor to invest in in this project. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe how... touch on the minimums. Uh, the minimums are 100k. By the way, for uh, investment, 100,000 US dollars is the is the minimum investment. Uh, there's a question about what, how much waste is left over from the distillation process and what will be done with that waste? That's a great, that's a great question, Randall. I love that question. That's the question that we've been talking about with Boris, the CEO, actually from, if you're familiar with distillation processes, there is a byproduct of a byproduct, right? <laughs> you get, you get ethanol and then you have a byproduct coming off of that. What we've talked about right now is making that into animal feed. Uh, we're talked about, and he's and Boris is leaning towards uh, pig feed right now because there is a caloric nature of, of that byproduct coming out that we can use it for another source so we have a byproduct of coffee cherries that you create ethanol from and from an ethanol process you have another byproduct you say hey man we, we still got we've got material left over can we do something with that and you're exactly right rando you can you can do something with that and we'll be investigating that over the next 12 months Okay. From, from James, how might climate change affect your business and what is being done to mitigate possible effects? The biggest change, I've talked about this on previous investor presentations before, the biggest change happening in climate change related to coffee is coffee will not grow at a very effective and potent nature without it going further up in altitude. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is low, let's say low altitude farming is going to get crushed. 
just crushed. So you have to move farther up the mountain to grow better coffees and to grow more efficiently. And it's, it's a big change from what happened in coffee farming that say 50 years ago. Colombia is probably the best place in the world to be growing co coffee further altitude because we actually have, even on our own farms, we have certain mountains that are too high right now where you reach a certain amount, typically around 1,800 meters above sea level, where it, the, it starts to decline again to where climate change hasn't actually pushed it all the way to the top. So there's still areas of our mountains that say, hey, our, our production is starting to decrease when you go up too high. If you're in Central America, for instance, a lot of times I'd say Costa Rica, Panama, where land is incredibly pricey, but altitudes are fairly small, places that historically have been pretty good for coffee farming, a lot of those regions can get absolutely crushed because they don't have the altitude to support to support coffee growing in the future. So low altitude farming, I would say, is the biggest risk to to a climate change effect on the business. Whereas in Colombia, we don't have that risk is not nearly as readable because we have such high altitude mountains that we already grow on. And we only buy farms that are high altitude. Uh, there was one from Adriana asking about why not put roasting facilities in Colombia? Yeah. There, That's there's two, question. there's two answers to that. Those are very good question. We, we actually researched this for probably over a year. Two major things are first logistics coming out of, out of Colombia. Once you have a roasted product, you have a freshness state. Now, for green coffee, if I vacuum seal green coffee and gave it to a non-expert, a non-Somalier of coffee that's been and you can roast it after. Most people will not know the difference if that coffee has been sitting for six months, eight months, 10 months, whatever, right? But for roasted product, once you roast it and grind it, and you can vacuum seal, you can do anything you want. After a few months, you don't have to be a sommelier of coffee to taste a, a change in the oxygen levels of that coffee and say, hey, this doesn't taste as good as it should be, right? So logistics coming out of Colombia are not as efficient as logistics coming out of Houston, Texas, or Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. The second is that it sounds it, it sounds a little silly, but there is a, I would say, a negative connotation related to a, pro a, branded, a product being branded as a Colombian-made product coming into the United States versus having a U.S.-made product. A product that's made from Colombian ingredients of coffee has an inherent value that is higher than I, this is made in Colombia, which is assumed to be a discount or potentially an inferior product. There's very few high level Colombian coffee products manufactured in Colombia from Colombian, Colombian source materials that are, are at a, anywhere near a premium quality level in the market. Mm -hmm. That was perfect. I, uh, next, another good question. What are your projections for the European and Asiatic markets? We trade right now with Asia. We've traded with, you know, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong before with, with coffee. Uh, we're heavily focused on the U S markets. Now, uh, we have some potential acquisitions we're looking at in Western Europe for roasters. Uh, they're, they could take, you know, they could take six months. They could take six years. Our two focus markets will definitely be first, United States will be our core focus for roasted coffee, and our second most likely will be Western Europe. Asia, I think, will be, you know, that would be like around the time of a potential IPO where we try to open up those markets as a, as a key focus. So I take this one. If I want to invest now, what do I do from here? So next step. So if you're interested in committing right now, increasing your commitment, if you're an invest, existing investor, excuse me, you can, if you got the invitation to this by email you can simply reply to that email and it'll come right to us and we can we can handle the commitment from there it's basically how, how much is the investment amount if you were forwarded the invitation for the webinar josh our head of director in uh, of our, our excuse me our director of investor relations left his email in the chat there you can contact him there but the email is investor.relations at legacy dash group dot dot co hope everybody tries to take advantage of the the first tranche here and the, the discount structure that we have in place but simple simple email and then because of the u.s nature of it everything is 
relatively seamless. It's DocuSign and everything. And then all of the banking that we do is, is US based as, as well. So it's pretty simple from, from here on out. Perfect. And I think that's a great place to wrap up, guys. If anyone has any more questions, we didn't get through a couple of these questions here at the end, but I think we're running into an hour and 20 minutes now. So to be cognizant of everyone's time, thank you for everyone for joining. Any other questions anyone has, please reach out to us personally. We'll be happy to jump on a call, send you emails, um, and get in now while you can. The price is never going to be lower, and we're incredibly happy that you came and saw us present the project. And coming to potentially be a new investor or add on to an existing investment if you're already an existing investor. Thank you. Perfect.